Yes. Well, um, so as you can guess, um, I'm going to be talking about uh, achieving affordable access for uh, for all, and it's going to be a fairly high level view with a focus on sub-Saharan Africa, uh, mostly because that's one of the most challenging areas to, um, to to actually achieve affordable access. And I guess the um, the first question is: Does it? I mean, do we need um, affordable access for everyone? And um, and I think uh, you know the answer has become much clearer as a result of the the pandemic, where those who have access to um, to the internet uh, are able to carry on education, carry on their jobs, um, carry on um, you know uh, the kinds of activities in a virtual way that they had been doing before. So anyone who had access during the pandemic had a huge leg up. But in general, I think the I mean, the internet is a kind of superpower and those of us who have had access, access to it for many years have sort of, you know, we now treat it as normal, but what you can do with a smartphone in your hand, I mean, is truly remarkable, right? You can navigate anywhere around the world, you can access uh, resources, you can sell things, you can uh, stay connected to your friends and family no matter where you are. It is truly remarkable, and I don't think we really sort of acknowledge it, it as much, but it also gives us a social and economic leg up, right? It, it just, it allows us more potential. And the result of that is those without access fall further behind just by standing still. Now, I mean, it's not, uh, you know, it's all not, not all sweetness and light, and you, this could easily be five lectures on uh, you know, surveillance capitalism, um, algorithmic uh, discrimination, uh, the um, corporate and government manipulation of, uh, of media, especially in elections. Um, there are uh, significant downsides to the internet, but it is very much a genie that is not going back in the bottle. So it's something that I think, you know, we need to figure out sort of like fixing a car um, as you're driving down the highway, um, but we, we seem to have little choice in that. Um, and I think in general, the benefits uh, significantly outweigh the downsides in terms of the opportunities that ac affordable access creates. Um, so, I mean, where, uh, in terms of where we are, um, you know, uh, the question becomes, you know, is what we're doing enough, right? Is, is uh, and what we're doing is really, you know, sort of large uh, telecommunications companies, uh, you know, Verizon, AT&T in, um, uh, in the US or MTN, Vodafone in, uh, in Africa, are they gonna, if we just do more of them, is that going to lead us to uh, ubiquitous affordable access? Well, I think the, the evidence suggests no. Um, and if we look at, uh, for instance, unique mobile subscriber penetration, and this is this, um, this data comes from the, um, the Industry Association for Mobile Network Operators around the world, the, the GSMA. And we can see that, um, that the, the growth is, is very much plateauing. So we're, we are, penetration is increasing, um, but it's increasing more slowly. And that's even more dramatic if we look at the internet. So these are um, inter internet penetration, um, number of internet users per 100 people uh, 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 taken from the World Bank who ultimately take it from the ITU. And once again, you can see this plateauing of growth, uh, particularly in the last few years. So that those, the, the blue um, columns are, are, are that increase in, um, uh, in users per 100 people, but then that, that red line and the sort of uh, dotted orange trend line represents the, the rate of growth, and that rate of growth is, uh, is steadily decreasing. Um, and, you know, it, in a way, it's pretty easy to figure out why. Um, and if you, if you break down the populations uh, of the earth uh, in terms of income, well, uh, in terms of affordable monthly spends, it's, um, you know, the mobile network operator solutions sort of fall into the one, two, three, and fourth uh, billion people in terms of income levels. For the rest of the world, uh, in terms of their ability to pay, 
it is much, much lower. And it suggests that the business models that we have, the commercial business models for um, national network operators may not be um, fit for purpose in terms of connecting the other half of the world. Um, happily, I think we're uh, we're going through another sort of transition in technologies. Uh, so, you know, if you look back to uh, say the early '90s, when when mobile uh, mobile network technologies really sort of took hold, it transformed um, the entire world. Really, I mean, the mobile uh, mobile technologies led to mobile internet, led to uh, to smartphones. I mean, it is utterly transformative. And that particular technology trend, uh, changed things, especially in emerging markets where, uh, you know, uh, phone lines were not being uh, built out in the traditional way, but mobile networks succeeded. Uh, so what is the, the, the shift in technology that I, well, there's two of them. Uh, and the first one is um, fiber optic infrastructure. And um, what makes fiber optic infrastructure so interesting uh, is is really one thing, and that is if you look at the capacity of other technologies. So on the left hand side there, you can see there's twisted pair, which is sort of your Ethernet cable, which is 100 megabits per second, and or a, a microwave link, not a traditional you know a kitchen microwave, but a microwave that points a, a direct link between two dishes, you know about two gigabits per second. Um, coaxial cable uh, or the you know cable internet can actually go up to uh, 10 gigabits per second, and, and millimeter wave, which is a very high frequency sort of microwave, you know, up to 40 gigabits per second. And all of those are fantastic technologies. But this is what fiber optic technology looks like. It looks like 25 terabits per second or more. It's the deep water port of the internet. And, uh, and what it means is that it's essentially a non-rival good. Right, you know, there's, there's, you could use up all the capacity you want as an operator on that on that fiber optic infrastructure, and still there would be plenty of room for for others for competition. Um, so it makes it a very foundational technology, and also you know it operates at the 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 speed of light or slightly under. So it is also very very high speed. And ten years ago, or a little over ten years ago, back in two thousand and nine, this is what fiber optic infrastructure around the African continent looked like. There was essentially one cable called the SAT-3 cable, and it was controlled by a South African consortium, uh, and it was just fantastically expensive. Uh, so for everyone on the continent, if you wanted to access telecommunications, it was mostly via satellite, and that was even more expensive. Fast forward to 2021, and there are over 16 uh, fiber optic cables encircling the continent with a design capacity now of over 700 terabits per second. It is quite amazing. And the last two cables that have been announced have been cables from, um, uh, from Google, the Equiano cable, and from Facebook, the two Africa cable, whose capacities together eclipses all the, capa the capacity of all the cables before them. So it's, it's phenomenal, um, the, the potential that has changed. And so, um, you know, this is a, just a simple graph showing that that the growth of capacity. But what that those undersea cables have triggered, it's almost like nature abhors a vacuum. Um, it has triggered massive investment in terrestrial fiber optic infrastructure. So now, um, uh, across the African continent, there are over a million kilometers of fiber optic infrastructure and that's all just in the last 10 years so it is it is a profound and change but largely underground so it's kind of invisible to um, to the observer but it's tremendously important because it means that wherever you where wherever you can get to the endpoint of a fiber optic network means that you're only milliseconds from the you know the living beating heart of the internet so it used to be that to be a telecommunications operator, you had to, you know, you had to build everything. You had to build the international link. You had to build the national network. You had to build the, uh, the, the middle mile infrastructure. And, you know, no matter how you did it, it was millions of dollars uh, to get started. Now, simply by accessing some point in this fiber optic network, you can be competitive with the best of players in the network. 
and that URL there is, is the um, the map that I maintain of, of terrestrial fiber uh, in Africa. And of course, I mean that that fiber is is everywhere now and elsewhere. And so, once you have fiber optic technologies, um, you know they can be delivered to the home in urban areas, but mostly, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, you need wireless technologies to deliver that access uh, to the end user. And those wireless technologies fall into two categories, uh, which uh, are licensed and unlicensed technologies. And the licensed and unlicensed refers to the radio waves, the spectrum that uh, that, that technology can use. And so on the left-hand side, you have a, you know, a mobile tower and you, know, you can find those just about anywhere, if you if you look up, you can uh, uh, often spot a a mobile tower, and that's that's what powers your your phone while you're you're traveling. Um, and the um, the way those operate is they operate at very high power, and um, they uh, each operator has exclusive use of uh, a range of spectrum to deliver that service, and it's that exclusivity that allows them to operate at very high power. On the right hand side, you see a bunch of Wi Fi equipment. And Wi Fi equipment uh, operates in frequencies that are known as either license exempt or unlicensed. So you don't have to get um, an expensive license uh, from the, uh, the national regulator uh, in the US, the FCC. You can simply buy the equipment and operate it. And um, uh, both of these technologies have to deal with interference. The way that the mobile technologies deal with interference uh, you know, from other wireless technologies is by giving this kind of exclusivity for which operators now pay a huge premium. Um, Wi-Fi works very differently. It operates at much lower power um, and, uh, and the technology simply plays nice uh, with, with, uh, with other technologies. So it sort of listens uh, politely before transmitting. And as a result, you get this huge ecosystem of, of, uh, of Wi-Fi that has proliferated uh, almost everywhere. Um, so here you can see, um, see a graph of the growth of, uh, of, of, of uh, internet traffic um, over the last five years. And you can see it's this, this uh, remarkable mix of, uh, of mobile technologies there up at the top, uh, and um, and then fixed Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi for mobile, and then and and wired access, and both of these technologies turn out to be tremendously important. But the um, uh, the limits of Wi-Fi are because it's low power, its range is 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 quite small. You know, you're talking typically about a hundred meters for a Wi-Fi hotspot, whereas um, these mobile networks can um, can transmit. You know. Uh, often a, um, a radius up to sort of 10 kilometers. And the great thing about these technologies is that they're all becoming dramatically cheaper. Uh, it used to be to build an LTE base station, you might pay $250,000 for a macro cell. And today you can buy an LTE radio base station for, I don't know, about six or $7,000. So now this technology, which once again needed this sort of national massive investment is now within the, within the, uh, the grip, the reach of, of much smaller operators. Um, and, and you see now this tremendous dichotomy between these two types of technologies. So uh, in the nineties, um, when mobile networks were just getting started, um, licenses were often just handed out or they are handed out for relatively modest sums and, and unlicensed uh, technologies were, um, uh, were free, of course. But now it's changed. Unlicensed Wi-Fi is still free, but Spectrum now is, is now auctioned for uh, billions of dollars. Um, in the case of uh, the US in Sub-Saharan Africa, it's, it's more like tens of millions of dollars, but uh, you can see these are these are um, auctions of spectrum re uh, recently in sub-Saharan Africa. And, um, you know, $67.5 million for a single spectrum license. If we're talking about trying to connect the unconnected and affordable access in the poorest, most sparsely populated areas, this is a tremendous sort of albatross to hang around the neck of an operator. But it's the world we live in. 
And unfortunately for small operators, the fact that millions of dollars or billions of dollars are being spent uh, at auction by these, by these national operators, it means the small operators are essentially locked out of the market except for Wi-Fi. And there are remarkable things you can do with Wi-Fi, but there's even more remarkable things that can be done with things like LTE technologies now in terms of reach and, um, uh, and affordability. So what I hope to convince you of today um, is that we need to change the ecosystem. And uh, the way I explain that is, you know, I, I ask you to imagine a mason jar and imagine trying to sort of stuff about, you know, roughly fist sized stones into a mason jar. And you might fit three or four of them uh, into that jar and it would look fill, uh, full. But if you were to fill that jar with water, uh, you would discover that uh, it's still more than 50% of the volume uh, is actually empty. Um, uh, and that's, uh, for me, that's an analogy of what we see with uh, in the telecommunications space is that uh, we have this jar that is uh, that looks full with, uh, with Verizon and AT&T, but in fact, we need different kinds, smaller, more nimble operators to be able to truly achieve affordable access for all. So uh, that includes wireless ISPs um, and uh, municipal networks and cooperatives. But in sub-Saharan Africa, it, 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 um, uh, it may also include nonprofit and non-market operators that act to, to uh, communally to, um, to deliver access. And it's that flexibility for different kinds of solutions using different technologies, different business models, that is actually the way to, to fill the jar. Now, if that analogy is too, um, uh, too abstract, um, you can also uh, look at it from the point of view of uh, Fernand Brodel, uh, who is a French economic historian. And he argued that we don't live in one economy, but we live in three economies a global economy, which is sort of the, the capitalist economy where the end game of the global economy is monopoly, that you know, the, you, is to grow as big as possible. But there is an entirely other economy, the local market economy, where small businesses don't seek to scale beyond their local area that provide local employment and serve local needs. And indeed, in many countries, small and medium enterprise occupy or produce more than 50% of GDP. They occupy an incredibly important role in the national uh, economy. Um, and, um, and even below that, we see, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, you see subsistence economies, uh, which range from uh, you know, farmers collectives to saving societies to uh, informal economies that uh, that act also very locally, but are non-market activities. And right now, from a telecommunications regulation point of view, in terms of what's allowed in most countries, there is this huge focus on that top tier, on that global economy, and there is a, a missing opportunity now to enable these these lower levels and to, to create uh, the space for them. So I'm going to give you some examples of what I think are absolutely amazing um, small local uh, internet uh, uh, and telecommunications uh, initiatives. This first one is called uh, is called Barn or Broadband for the Rural North, and it's set up in Lancashire, uh, which is the northernmost part of England. And it's in an area that's all farmland and uh, relatively low income compared to the rest of the country. And uh, it was in an area that British Telecom declared um, uh, uneconomic to, to build out infrastructure. And uh, Barn was started by, uh, by a housewife who was fed up with, um, uh, with not being able to get high speed access to, to the internet because she wanted to get a diagnosis for her husband who was suffering from um, an ailment and and couldn't actually be transported to uh, to the doctor, uh, and so um, th that started with a wireless network, but it led to the building of a fiber optic network across Lancashire to the point that now uh, it's actually sort of seven years on. Um, they have over seven thousand households connected to fiber 
and not just any fiber, one gigabit symmetric fiber, which is faster than the fastest broadband you can buy from anyone else in the UK, covering an area of 18,000 square kilometers. But my, my favorite statistic about Barn is the number of customers they've lost in the last seven years. And that is one, because when you're a cooperative, you own the company, right? So it's a, it's a very different way of, of looking at things. And indeed in the United States, uh, you know, with the, with the New Deal in the 1930s, there was huge investment in electric cooperatives that led to sort of mass electrification of rural areas in the US. And many of those electric cooperatives are now becoming fiber cooperatives. Now going to the, uh, uh, the other side of the, the earth uh, in South Africa, this is in the Eastern Cape uh, of South Africa in an extremely rural area. This is another cooperative uh, called Zenzeleni. And uh, they've built uh, their network with Wi-Fi because Wi-Fi was the only thing they could get access to, but it's quite, uh, it's remarkable what can be done with Wi-Fi. And in an area that was, uh, you know, um, uh, very, very poor, even by South African standards, they've built a successful, sustainable business uh, uh, as a cooperative, so not uh, non-profit seeking, connecting businesses uh, and um, thousands of, uh, of people in the area and at, um, uh, you know, 20 to 100 times cheaper than, uh, than the incumbent telecom is offering services. And they're going from strength to strength. So they're a federation of cooperatives and they're spreading uh, from, uh, from community to community through the, uh, through the Eastern Cape. Um, and here, this is, this is Lawrencetown back up to, to North America. And this is actually uh, not far from me. It's about a um, couple of hundred kilometers away from me. And this is a small town, you know, it's a, a rural community, about 600 people who live there. And uh, they, you know, they're not far from um, the capital of the province, Halifax, but there was no access from the incumbent. And so um, the, the citizens formed a cooperative uh, and they bought the technology, uh, which is Wi-Fi technology. And they now serve 230 customers in the town. Um, they started out charging $45 a month. They discovered that was too much money and they had to reduce it to, to $29 a month because they were making too much money. Um, and interestingly, they had so much success uh, using the form of a cooperative to build their own access infrastructure, they decided to, uh, to use that same structure to um, organizational structure to solve their health problems because they couldn't get a doctor to serve their, their community. So they uh, invested in a health cooperative, which is now linked to this internet cooperative. Um, and, uh, and lastly, this is, uh, this is in Mexico, in the state of Oaxaca, um, and um, uh, it's an organization called uh, Rhizomatica, and it's a nonprofit that has built um, GSM, or mobile infrastructure, uh, and delivered it to uh, 14 community operators in 60 different localities, and they have about um, three and a half thousand users daily. And the interesting thing about them is that they've gained access to this sort of, you know, the mobile spectrum, which is not, which is licensed spectrum. And it was because the regulator um, created the space for them to exist, that they are now thriving uh, once again in a space where the, where the incumbents um, showed no interest in, in, uh, in building infrastructure. So um, I think the, the point here is that these are great examples. They're wonderful examples uh, of what people can do if they're allowed to do it. But they're a bit like um, this flower, you know, growing in the concrete in that they, they exist in spite of the policy and regulatory environment, not because of it. And, what need, and I think what needs to happen now is that we need to unlock the, the regulatory environment to allow um, hundreds or thousands or hundreds of thousands of these kind of local initiatives to build internet infrastructure uh, to thrive. And I think it's not just a way of bringing cheap access, but it's also a way of increasing people's agency and sense of autonomy and control over the internet, which is a, 
uh, you know, a service which we, I think, increasingly feel less control over. So that, um, that is my talk for today. I leave you, leave you with the um, side of this uh, university uh, building, I think it's in, in Delft, uh, with the, uh, the, the phrase, the next big thing will be a lot of small things. So um, thank you. And uh, I hope there are questions. Yeah, that was that that was great. That's super super interesting. Um, the um, uh, so I, I was I was wondering, you know, to what degree this idea of local uh, internet infrastructure includes um, other kinds of services. You know, you mentioned like the Lawrence Town Co-op and its relationship to the health services, and and I guess I'm I'm think. Um, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about like the um, the voice over uh, IP, you know, um, the village telco example that, I mean, maybe you could sort of where, you know, it, it, it catered to um, voice communications, right? Because that was uh, apparently uh, more desirable than uh, just uh, data communications. But um, uh, I, I the, the question of sort of local control around Internet infrastructure. Uh, I, I'm I'm just wondering to how if you, if you've thought about how it relates to other kinds of services, whether they're you know um, uh, you know local data centers, uh, other kinds of web applications, these kinds of things. Um, are, so uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, with regard to to voice infrastructure. Um, yeah, a couple of things uh, there. One is that you know, um, voice has become so much an internet technology as opposed to telecommunications technology that um, you know we you know we make phone calls on WhatsApp or Telegram or Signal um, that you know the traditional phone system has faded in terms of its its significance, which is why, you know, Village Telco sort of, you know, found its own sort of quiet end there. Um, and the other challenge you have is that if you want to, once you go into the realm of phone numbers, um, that, that, is a, uh, that is a very um, tightly controlled uh, space where you have to negotiate what's called interconnection with the big operators to get your phone numbers to connect to their phone numbers. And often that's used as a, as a kind of a, a means of excluding smaller operators because they will often be slow to, to organize this interconnect to make sure that you know, phone numbers on my network connect to phone numbers on the other network. So often the quickest way around that is simply to use a, you know, um, a, you know, an OTT uh, voice app that, uh, you know, not necessarily commercial ones like the ones I mentioned, but also you know, the host of, of open source um, alternatives. But and and to answer your question, yes, I think I think local, uh, you know, lo local data storage, local apps, there there is huge potential now. I mean, you know, the the distributed web uh, is sort of the pushback against the centralization of in infrastructure in Silicon Valley, um, and it struggles, right? It struggles. Distributed uh, applications. Um, uh, you know, have weaknesses in compare in comparison to the the deeply centralized ones. You know, for instance, a deeply centralized technology is easy to update because you only update one thing, whereas distributed technologies are are kind of slow in that regard. Um, but I think it's you know they're getting better and better, and the opportunity to to host local services and apps and uh, and to make you know local decisions about infra internet infrastructure in terms of you know. Um, uh, yeah, I'm you know verging onto to sort of dangerous ground here. But um, in terms of what um, what to prioritize for the internet, you know, um, and and what to uh, you know uh, censorship is a terrible thing, but so is hate speech and uh, and the. The, the most sensible thing I've ever heard about dealing with censorship is that if you do it, you want to push it to it as far as close, as far uh, away to the edges of the internet as possible. Um, and so, you know, for instance, 
uh, I have I have three kids, and uh, you know uh, our family. We have discussions about what's okay, uh, you know, in terms of internet viewing, and that's a fine, you know, that's a very fine grain kind of uh, uh, control of the internet. But I think there are other areas as well. For instance, in um, in Oaxaca, in uh, at the uh, with the Rizomatica network, the when they first set up these these phone networks. Uh, the uh, the men in the community said uh, that they wanted to be able to you know see the call logs to see who their wives had been phoning, uh, and um, you know it was a, it was a community decision that that was not okay, right? You know that uh, that that uh, you know that uh, that there would be privacy. It was something that you know that you know you uh, was negotiated in a way that that was respectful of all the voices that uh, that were there, and I think that's. That's something that these local networks can do is that technology is a blind amplifier, right? And it amplifies inequalities. And I think once you bring networks to back more locally, you can address some of those inequalities in, in more effective ways. And, and, and so that gets to, I guess, the kind of advocacy side of your argument around sort of trying to convince, I guess, a shift in regulations and policies to encourage these kinds of local initiatives. That's, that, that's kind of the, the, the you, you, you would rather, do you think like subsidies would be the approach here or the, the difference between sort of the license versus unlicensed, the fact that you have these, um, uh, these bidding, like the, the sort of market dynamics around like that basically exclude all the small players with the, with the high prices that are being paid to have access to uh, licensed radio frequencies? Like, should there be some kind of partitioning like that? Should, should national regulators be sort of carving out some of the, this, the radio frequencies with an intention of giving them to small nonprofit and cooperative operators? Absolutely. I think, I mean, you've touched on two things there. One is financing and, and the other is, is access to, to spectrum. On the financing front, um, you know, typically most countries have a universal service fund and that universal service fund is contributed to by the, the national network operators and they expect that money back to subsidize them to, to build out into rural areas, which has had some success. But in areas that are truly uneconomic for those big operators, it doesn't work, and they they build towers, they abandon them because you know they're they're accountable to their shareholders. Um, so opening up universal service funds to cooperatives, to municipalities, to uh, community groups, I think you know opens up a tremendous uh, a potential, and not just as grants, but you know like um, uh, zero interest loans or trusts. Um, in Ammon, Idaho, uh, a fantastic story of building a municipal network there town of 15,000 people. And um, what they did as the, as the community, um, it was gonna cost $3,000 per household to, to connect everyone to fiber. And so they offered everyone a uh, zero interest loan over 20 years, uh, which added up to about $8 a month, um, uh, which was attached as a lien to the properties and that financed fiber to everyone. And uh, and now they have they have competition in terms of who delivers access over, over that fiber. That's just one model. I think there are uh, you know uh, twenty new uh, interesting finance and ownership models that can fundamentally change um, you know the the cost structure of building out, especially in rural areas. And I think uh, you know rural areas in particular are are the missing component, right? Urban areas will never really suffer for um, uh, for internet access, but you know, there's not a there's not a, a, a north south digital divide. There is an urban rural digital divide globally. I live in rural Nova Scotia, and so I mean, uh, I mean, I, I know exactly what I'm talking about because you know, getting incumbents to invest in infrastructure is very very hard. And even if you do get one operator to invest, you are it's not like you have choice. You are just you know you are you are effectively stuck with a monopoly uh, providing your access. So things like cooperatives, I think are super exciting. I mean, they're, I mean, this, they have such an incredible track record of delivering affordable rural services in agriculture, in, uh, in finance, 
is just a missing opportunity in, um, in telecommunications. And on, the, um, and on the spectrum front, you get exactly the same problem. You get a lot of spectrum that's been assigned by the regulator, by the, you know, so the FCC, but it's all in use in urban areas. The operators aren't using that spectrum in rural areas. So, um, and the, the US is actually the most exciting frontier uh, on this in terms of regulation. So um, the FCC have introduced the uh, CBRS um, broadband service, uh, citizens broadband in, um, in 3.5 gigahertz, uh, which is a great LTE slash 5G frequency. But they've done it on a granular basis, right? So instead of issuing it nationally, they've issued it uh, on a, I forget what the US designations are, is it the county or a, uh, but you know, and in much smaller tra uh, tranches and they've got three tiers of access. So you can buy a license um, uh, or you can use it in a kind of Wi-Fi like way. And so just to the, um, to the south of you, the uh, the University of Washington are doing just uh, exactly that. They're they're using this spectrum now to build a uh, an LTE community network in uh, in Seattle, which is super cool. Uh, so you know it's the the old saying by you know William Gibson. You know the the, um, the future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. There are great examples such as the ones I've uh, listed in the presentation, but also um, many others. It's just a question of now normalizing the regulation that uh, that enables their spread i mean it's part of a it's part of a broader narrative i think of a, of re-empowering local economies in a in a world of kind of you know um amazon and starlink and um you know this sort of relentless globalization that has been fueled by the internet uh, um so so i mean cooperatives don't happen in a vacuum i mean with in your research do you are, are there examples that recurring sort of dynamics of how communities come together and organize their association with other sort of, uh, or, you know, institutions, organizations in their communities that help facilitate this process or like, you know, what, what seems to, are there differences that you've identified between the sort of initiatives that seem to thrive versus those that kind of are short lived? Yeah, great question. Yeah, so um, where there are existing social structures for getting uh, things done locally, um, that's where cooperatives uh, tend to tend to thrive. So in the case of Oaxaca, uh, you know, these communities already had, uh, you know, collective mechanisms for buying things that their villages needed. Uh, so they, you know, it wasn't a big stretch to, uh, to actually extend these structures to um, uh, you know, into the realm of telecommunications because the the sort of uh, the orgware, the social mechanisms uh, for doing that were already there. Whereas, in contrast, uh, in the Eastern Cape in South Africa, um, those social mechanisms largely did not exist for for whatever reason, and it was a process, I think, of nearly eight years of kind of. Um, of organization, of kind of capacity building and, and development that finally led to this now robust cooperative. And um, so it's, um, you know, where cooperatives have continued to thrive uh, and cooperative like structures, uh, you know, uh, which exist in many different forms, um, then, you know, it, it becomes, you know, a kind of a, they, it's more intuitive to simply say, okay, like this, but for, you know, the internet. Uh, whereas, you know, in some places you're, you're starting from scratch. And um, yeah, it, it is interesting in that it is very antithetical to, not antithetical, but very different from startup culture, right? You know, and so there is, especially around internet technologies, there is this kind of zeitgeist of kind of, well, we just need another internet startup to, to solve this problem. And cooperatives bring a, a very different kind of perspective to the problem. Hmm. Yeah, that, that's that's an interesting uh, interesting point about the the distinction between sort of cooperatives versus the sort of startup uh, corporate um, uh, culture. Um, uh, are there any other questions from other folks? Joe, Matthew, you guys have any questions? Um, um, I I have a couple. Uh, first of all, thank thank you for your presentation. Uh, it was really thought provoking. Uh, appreciate it. Um, my 
first question is, um, I'm curious about the how the the nature of the of data parity in terms of how infrastructures are set up, how this how it affects um, uh, distribution. For example, you know, uh, traditionally with copper copper infrastructure, your your download uh, bandwidth is way way higher than your upload bandwidth, and I think that you know the uh, the pandemic has sort of highlighted that uh, that disparity. Um, and a lot of fiber op offer a more equally paired upload and download uh, capacity. I'm just curious as to how you see this affecting um, what you're um, discussing. Uh, yeah, very interesting question. So yeah, certainly copper line technologies were very asymmetric in nature and uh, very sort of prioritized towards um, towards download and um, uh, and that was fine um, until uh, it was just what that was mostly fine uh, because most people weren't content creators. Um, and um, but I think you know now now that we're all content creators, you know, in our in our own Zoom uh, participatory environments, uh, at the very least, if not if not more, then um, you know we yeah we we want technologies that uh, that allow us to to give as much as uh, as as we take. Um, and really, it's not, uh, I mean, it used to be a, a challenge to do that sort of thing. But you know, that as the example in of barn in, in, uh, in Northern England, it's, you know, uh, technology has sort of made that problem uh, largely disappear if you want it to to disappear. So I mean the interesting. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. Go, please go ahead. I mean, the, um, you know, the, the interesting thing about fiber um, is, you know, as I mentioned, it's very, very high capacity technology, but it's essentially created this kind of um, almost a, a feudal structure around internet infrastructure, and in that if you can have access, to, if you own fiber. Um, then uh, it's very easy to extend your fiber and it's very easy to gain access from others because you do what are called capacity swaps. So instead of uh, having to pay for access on somebody else's network, you'll simply, you, you, you offer them a portion of your network in exchange for, your, for their network, which I, I think is sort of, you know, analogous to, you know, minor royalty marrying off their children during the, uh, during feudal times. And that it was, you know, you extended your influence without, um, without too much, um, uh, a, a significant investment, but if you don't own fiber, then you're essentially a vassal, right? Because fiber operators will charge you whatever they want, and that's that's the case here in Nova Scotia. We're trying to build our own local community network, and negotiating a cheap enough price is uh, is hard. Um, and so there is this kind of you know two tier ecosystem of those who have fiber and those who don't. And, um, and it makes the, the issue of internet exchange points, which is where you know, lots of networks peer, they become like the, the watering holes of the internet. If you can get to an internet exchange point, you, know, you can guarantee that the price of your internet will be rock bottom. But anywhere away from those watering holes, um, you know, it's, uh, uh, um, it just depends. Well, th thanks so much. This is great. It's really interesting stuff. Uh, it's my pleasure. I mean, it's, uh, you know, I could talk all day about it. So I'm glad to, <laughs> to, to, to have the opportunity. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so, so what, uh, what, what are you, how, what are you working on these days? Like how's, uh, um, how are you? How are you coping with the pandemic? Um, well, I'm doing a lot of this, really. You know, mm -hmm. um, so still working on policy and regulation, but traveling a lot less, which, um, which actually for me has turned out to be a big improvement. Um, in that, uh, you know, my uh, carbon footprint has uh, has diminished, and uh, I spend more time with my kids. So I know the pandemic has been. 
uh, horrific, you know, for, for many people, but I am um, a fortunate beneficiary in this context. So my, my days are spent at the moment working with the uh, Communication Authority of Kenya um, mm. on this exact issue of unlocking licensing for small operators and access to spectrum and, um, and you know, uh, unlocking potential for, for community operators. Mm. Well, thanks so much for meeting with us, coming uh, to, to present or joining, you know, hopping on Zoom. So uh, it's uh, nice to meet you. So uh, thanks. Uh, likewise, nice to meet you. And um, uh, thanks for the, uh, the opportunity. Cheers, guys. Toodaloo. Bye bye.